Chelsea on a Thursday night. And I'm going to invite you to come along with me as we're going to run in and try to get some pictures of an exhibition by the great Julian Schnabel. Stay tuned. to say Julian was always known for his audacity and it doesn't look like he's uh, given up on that aspect. This piece has got to be at least you know, what, 12, 14 feet tall. Well, uh, I hope that they aren't uh, too uptight with their photo policy tonight. There's Chris Martin, Mike Cockrell. How are you, beautiful? Good, man. How are you? Good. I just met the great Chris Martin for the first time. It's long overdue there, Mike. I'm going to keep walking. I have to admit, it, I heard about this show a couple of days ago in a uh, pang of, I don't know, I guess what you would call anxiety came over me. Not uh, bad anxiety, but maybe what Harold Bloom has called the anxiety of influence. I was a uh, young artist who had just moved to New York from Idaho, and I was going to the Art Students League, which Little did I know it was like saying you you went to art school in a van down by the river. Anyway, I had heard about Soho, but I'd never been there before, and I finally got a map and reconnoitered, figured out where Soho was, jumped on the subway. Went down there, I was wandering around, kind of looking for something like a gallery, and uh, walked into this little space uh, on Broadway, 420. And uh, this is the new Mary Boone Gallery. And the first show I saw in Soho in New York, 1979, was Julian Schnabel's debut show there. And in a way, I kind of feel like uh, the way Arthur Danto talked about having an epiphany when he walked into Andy Warhol's Brillo Box show. Well, little did I know when I walked into that gallery that uh, within about a year or so, Julian Schnabel would become the the art phenomenon of the 80s. This particular piece is titled Self-Portrait as a Blind Swordsman Searching for Louise. Okay, they don't have dimensions or medium. I wonder if this is cast or whether this is wood. Julian has done me a big favor. These pieces are all titled Rose paintings, some of them are large rose paintings. And they don't have the dimensions, so I'll just wing it here. So this one is probably about uh, 8 by 12 feet. And uh, so these are part of his broken plate series. And they're on. Uh, thick wooden panels. I guess they probably stand out about six inches from the wall. Well, the first paintings that I saw by Julian that moved me were these kind of waxy brown paintings dealing with broken or chopped up torsos. It's kind of surrealistic. I believe this is oil. Just last week, we went in and 
saw an exhibition by Sandro Kia, who is also one of the, one of the prime movers for neo-expressionism or what other people have referred to as uh, the rediscovery of painting. Actually, uh, I kind of like the parts where the uh, the plates are coming through. They're not totally covered by the paint. You get a little chance to see the materiality of these. Oh, gee. There's Julian right there. Jonah Makers. Cool. Hey, he's got paint on his pants. <laughs> This one is probably about eight feet square. Even the kids are excited. Uh, I was initially kind of looking at this and wondering, gee, where is this coming from? Normally we'd have some nasty figurative things happening or some kind of mythical imagery or surrealism but now I uh, maybe Julian is riffing a little bit on late Monet or maybe even Monet some of Monet's floral studies Chris Martin just informed me that uh, one of the reasons that these pieces are all based on Roses at Van Gogh's grave is that Julian is working on a movie now about Van Gogh. So, that explains it. Okay, this is titled Rose Painting Near Van Gogh's Grave 3, 2015. And I would say that's probably about by four and a half feet. And here we've got beveled edges. Well, Julian was a very ambitious painter. I'll give you kind of a quick rundown of his history. He was born in Brooklyn. At some point the family moved to Brownsville, Texas. And then he came back to New York and uh, studied in the Whitney Studio program. This is also a large rose painting near Van Gogh's grave. Number seven. 2016. Also, I think he was he was working as a short order cook for Miss Mickey Reskin at one of his clubs, and uh, he was very engaged and was also known for his generosity. But uh, he would cook for a bunch of artists and then take a break and come out and uh, mingle with the crowd and introduce himself. This is number 11, 2016, and I would say this is probably at least 8 by 8, maybe 8 by 10. Uh, as I'm looking at this piece, I kind of uh, was thinking that these have a whole kind of decorative quality that I haven't seen Julian kind of stretch out in before, and uh, in certain ways it almost makes me think of... Uh, Robert Zakonich, or Zakonich. He was uh, maybe one of the most highly recognized painters in the pattern decorative movement. I think you could go back at one of the early calm reports and see a show that he did down at Berkstadt, uh, geez, 10 years ago. 
the art world was ready for a change. Minimalism and conceptualism and other kinds of various intellectual uh, cul-de-sacs had kind of paralyzed a lot of the a lot of the art world. And uh, well, Julian was able to kind of provide the uh, what could I say the the heroic figure. And uh, also, I think that he had spent some time in Europe and maybe had uh, assimilated that energy and the uh, kind of renewed interest in painting that was going on there. shows and uh, I was a big fan. <laughs> oh gee, there, there's the Rubels, some of the biggest collectors in America. I was, I was curious about whether or not young people would be showing up for this. I think uh, Julian is probably about 65 or 66 at this point, and in many ways you could say that he is one of the preeminent artists of his generation, and you could almost track various trends in art history by Julian's uh, acceptance in the art world or non-acceptance. As I was saying, he was a big, uh, big part of New York's version of neo-expressionism. More big roses near Van Gogh's grave. But he also uh, was kind of disparaged for his uh, Macho stance. Uh, there was a whole group of critics and writers that were kind of gathered around October magazine, <laughs> painting jihad cadre, as I've referred to them before. And uh, well, I guess because Julian was the most popular, most recognized artist at the time. He also was the focus of a lot of their ire, their nasty criticism. Now, I'm not sure what he's uh, gluing these things on with, but he used to use uh, Bondo, which is a material that, uh, for any of you body and fender people, you know what Bondo is. It's what you use to fill, fill in little dents in your car, and it's very adhesive sticks well and I guess it's pretty well I don't know whether it's archival these things last a hundred years it'll be doing well see there's Walter Robinson hello the saying show me the money <laughs> it's not all about Monet but I was picking up on the same thing what do you think Walter You've known I Julian for a long Ju time. I love Julian Schnabel. I think it's so cool he's come back to the plate painting. And uh, do you think he's still relevant to young artists today, Julian, and his work? Well, who's to say what's relevant to young artists? That's a good point. We I don't even know if there are any young artists. They're kind of old school. I, yes. The broken plates represent the fragmented psyche of modern man, right? Oh, is that what it is? Well, don't you think? <laughs> Plus, uh, it's all about the earth, right? Plates are made out of ceramics, are made out of earth. I like Fire your interpretation there. I stole that from Don Cuspin. 
If you look on Art Right Magazine in 1999, yes. Donald Cuspin wrote a fabulous article about Julian's play paintings. His most sensitive Art paintings. Right. Was most, that a magazine? One of the greatest art magazines Art Right, of all I meant time. Artnet. Artnet Art Art online. Artnet. Art <laughs> Artnet. I'm messing up your continuity, Art. It's good, Walter. Thank you. Yes, we'll all look at Artnet. Donald Cuspin, 1979, writing about Julian Schnabel. It's interesting. We have Cuspin, we have Schnabel and Kia both in town. That's what I was saying. This is like uh, old home week. Well, even when I was looking at Julian's work back in the mid 80s, late 80s, I knew that he was uh, very ambitious. And it was only a matter of time before he realized that the art world in many ways is small, tiny, elitist, <laughs> exclusive, and uh, well, he had bigger visions and that's when he started making movies. I think his, his Basquiat movie was very good. I think it was Gary Oldman played Julian. And uh, maybe he even uh, he got David Bowie in there to play Andy Warhol. Great movie. And he did a couple of other interesting movies. I think it was Before Sunsets was a nice piece about a Cuban poet and uh, Butterfly in the Diving Bell, I think, was even nominated for an Academy Award. I always, unfortunately, kind of felt like uh, the amount of effort and attention that you would have to put into filmmaking, and it's not even in the directing, but in things like the editing and the financial ends of things kind of uh, detracted his attention from serious painting. And uh, it was a kind of a, for me, there was a drop off in the quality or maybe the, the authenticity, the sincerity of the work uh, when he got into the film business. Walter about whether or not Julian was still relevant to young artists and I guess if we howdy, howdy, if we walk around looks like there's some some young artists here oh, that's flashy God, that was sweet, guys. Made my night. Thank you. <laughs>